next teaching in our Cries of the Oppressed series, we're turning our attention to pastor and author Mark Strong, who was a guest teacher for our friends at Bridgetown Church last Sunday. Next week, we're going to continue this conversation as a church as we explore more practical steps on combating racism and injustice. But for now, let's take this opportunity to listen and to learn from Mark's powerful word to disciples of Jesus about race, justice, and black pain. It is uh, good to be with you today and just have an opportunity to, just to share with you uh, just uh, my heart uh, in lieu of some of the things we see going on in our world today. Let's just be honest with one another. We are living in an absolutely crazy time. Uh, we're smashed with the COVID virus and everybody's been in quarantine in the house for a little while. And then uh, on top of that, we have the uh, murder of George Floyd and the, the uh, protests and everything's going on. We are in a pressure cooker as, as a nation. We're in a pressure cooker as a people. We're in a pressure cooker um, as a church. And I, today what I want to do is I, I don't want to come like I'm a guy that has uh, all the answers because I don't. In fact, if I'm honest with you today, uh, I, I'm, I'm sharing from my heart, but I really don't feel like I, you know, I know exactly, you know, what to say or what I can say to be able to help. But there are just some things that God has placed upon my heart that I believe will be helpful, irregardless of how I feel uh, as a African American man who's kind of going through the struggle of everything that's happened and so forth. The first thing I want to say is this, is that uh, as, as, as believers, it's, it's different if we're talking to uh, non-believers or non-followers of Jesus Christ. But as believers, our primary objective and goal in life here on earth is to become like Jesus Christ. We uh, uh, accept him, we follow him, and our goal is to be transformed and shaped into his image. And sometimes we think about uh, discipleship, we think about being formed and shaped in the image of Christ. There's something that just kind of gets lost uh, in, that, in that mindset as it relates to what we see going on in our world. We have this view uh, many times in our mind that as we become like Jesus, it makes us kind of irrele uh, irrelevant or unable to really grasp or understand or really to be able to um, kind of articulate what's going on and to have an impact in the way that the world is going in the and uh, within the circumstances that the world is experiencing. But what I want to say to you today is that none of what's happening right now in this world is a shock to God. He's not surprised. He's not overwhelmed. He's not scratching his head. He's not having a panic attack. He's not saying, what in the world do I do? He understands it. He knows it. He sees it. And the beautiful thing is, he's willing to help us work in this situation to bring about kingdom ends. For us as believers, that's our ultimate responsibility, is to bring about kingdom ends and to bring about what God desires to be to, to bring about what God desires to happen on earth. After all, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. He said, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus, by uh, teaching us to pray that prayer, he's making a statement. He's saying to pray for God's will to be done but then there's something else he's saying that's interwoven in those words, and that is this. He's saying that you pray for God's will to be done on earth because God's will being done on earth is not something that just happens naturally and normally. For God's will to be done on earth, it takes God's grace, God's mercy, God's power, God's providence to come and to help uh, a, a fallen and broken world to experience and to do what it is that he desires to do. So in the midst of COVID, in the midst of Black Lives Matter, in the midst of trying to deal with uh, uh, what's going on with this George, the George Floyd murder, which we'll talk about here in, in just a second, God's heart is that his will can be done in this situation. 
And we'll talk a little bit about what that, that may look like. As a church, to be formed and to be shaped like Jesus means that we have to love our neighbor, love one another. Now, when we talk about love, sometimes we think of love as just this passive, kind of milk toast, non-forceful, uh, just kind of whatever happens, happens. You know, you, 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 you turn the other cheek, you just kind of soak it all in, and there's no kind of uh, fortitude to, uh, to go forward and to make change. Well, that's not the way the scripture describes love. Love, in, in, in many ways, and many times, it's a violent thing. Violent in this sense, that what it does is it goes against the powers that be, it goes against the structures, it goes against mindsets and mentality to bring about God's will, which is good for all people. And so to, to actually to, to love requires us to do something that's many times unnatural, doesn't line up with our, with our natural thinking, doesn't line up with our emotions and what we would desire to see happen or what we think we should do in order to render justice within our own strength and our own resources. But love says uh, you, you are empowered to act to bring about God's results. So when we think about what's happening in our nation uh, in terms of race right now, we've got to be people that love one another. One of the key components to loving one another is we have to have understanding about one another. Right now, the focus is on black America. The focus is on the unjust uh, 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 actions that have taken place upon uh, the life of uh, George Floyd and, and how that uh, senseless killing has turned the whole world upside down away where you have hundreds of thousands of people across the globe marching and saying that we want justice. And so I think as believers, it's important for us to understand how we get to a place like that. It's important to understand what's behind a statement, Black Lives Matter. It's, it's important for us to understand uh, what's behind uh, a, a, a man like Martin Luther King. What's behind civil rights activists? What's behind some of the uh, uh, words and some of the emotional expressions that we see happening from African Americans across our nation and across the globe? I want to put this in a, scrip a scriptural context to kind of help us kind of understand what I want to call black pain. There's a scripture found in uh, Matthew chapter 2. Um, I'm going to start from verse 16, read through verse 18. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise man, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its districts from two years old and under according to the time which he had determined from the wise man. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, we understand that this is uh, Jeremiah the prophet. He's prophesying, uh, you know, hundreds of years ago, about a time when uh, uh, Rachel, symbolic of Israel, would be weeping because uh, her children would be killed by a political entity for no reason at all. Herod uh, kills these children because he's heard from the wise man, wise man that a king was born, and so what he decides to do is to uh, uh, commit like a genocide to wipe out everybody, every young boy, that was under the age of two, that, that, that was born during the time the wise men said that the Christ child was being born. And so what happens is he goes to Bethlehem and he kills every two-year-old baby. And the response that the prophet says is Rachel is weeping. She's lamenting. She's crying out because her children are no more. And then the scripture says this, she refuses to be comforted. 
So when we talk about uh, black pain, I think this is a powerful text that kind of helps us wrap our minds and our hearts around uh, what that pain is kind of like to give us an understanding. You have to understand that for the African American, uh, the pain that they've experienced didn't just start with George Floyd's murder. The pain has been going on for over 400 years from slavery, from the time that Africans were pulled out of Africa, brought to America, and sold in slavery, separated from their families, experienced Jim Crow laws, broken apart, torn apart, made to work hard, didn't know if they were going to live from one day to the next. Finally, when, when uh, so-called emancipation comes, they're struggling, they're still oppressed, they still deal with racism. There's been a 400-year narrative that's taken place. And sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, yeah, why don't you guys just get over it? Why don't, why, why don't you just, just bag it? That's something that happened a long time ago. Well, the reality, the reality is this. Even though slavery happened hundreds of years ago, the narrative still continues. And every time there's an incident that happens, it just continues to rip open the scab and the, 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 the pain goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it creates, a, it, it creates and it brings to surface a trauma that has never, ever really been gotten over. The other day I was preaching at a, uh, a, a, large, a, a large church and I was talking a little bit about racism. And after the service, God bless this young white girl, she comes up to me and she says to me, she says, I thought that we were through with that. I never, I never would have known that racism still existed in America today. She says, I was so shocked. I was on the bus with my husband and there was a black man that was on the bus and he was helping me. And he, she says, this white person came up and just begin to assault him and talk crazy to him. I couldn't believe that this kind of thing still exists. Well, it does exist. I remember as a boy, I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood in Bellevue, Washington. My family was the only, uh, one of the only black families on the block. We were one of the only black families in the school, me, my brother, and maybe a couple other African-American kids. And I remember the first day I walked home from the first grade, I'm coming up from the stairs, and there are uh, three, uh, three or four uh, little white boys that uh, lived on my block. We, they, uh, they never said hi. They never said, let's play. The first words that came out of their mouth was, go home and wash that paint off your face. Now, I get that message as a first grader. Then fast forward a year or two. We're on the bus, we're goofing off. We're being bad kids on the bus. You know, when you ride the school bus, you're supposed to sit down and wait till you get the right place. But you know how boys will be boys. So we're jumping around. I'm the only black kid on the bus. We're jumping around, we're playing this game, and guys are hopping from seat to seat. And so uh, I'm moving around just like everybody else. And so the bus driver, he says, Mike, sit down. He says, Scott, sit down. He says, uh, uh, Mike, you sit down. And then he says, you too, black boy, you sit down. Now, everybody else has a name, but I'm just black boy. I cannot tell you the times, younger growing up, where I saw my father come in the house and they're, they're you know, they, you know uh, riding and, and these marshes are nothing new. I remember watching my father go through civil rights things. He would come home and sometimes just lay on the floor because they, because they had been gassed. I, I watched him struggle in his job and in his employment with different race, racist types of things. My point is this, that it's a continuum. It continues to happen over and over and over and over again. And just because it may be out of your mind or out of your sight, it does not mean that it does not exist. And what happens is when that wound festers and the wound grows and it hits a place and it reaches a a, a, a pitch where it's like, I just can't take anymore. So we had uh, the young man, uh, 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 Ahmaud Aubrey. We saw the other, uh, Breonna Taylor, and then now George Flo Floyd. What are people supposed to do with that kind of anger? What in the world, what, what do you do that? You just can't say, oh, go take a chill pill, just kind of relax or just kind of pray about it. It opens up wound and wounds and the pain gnashes. The pain is deep. The pain hurts. The pain 
torments, the pain tortures. And you say, what do I do to deal with this kind of pain? The scripture says, Rachel lamented. And the, uh, the, 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 the kicker is this. It said she refused to be comforted. So in other words, she has this pain because her children are gone. She has this pain because innocent uh, little boys, under, two and under, they're wiped out. And she's saying, listen, don't comfort me. Don't talk to me. Don't try to appease me. Don't give me platitudes. Don't give me little cliches. Don't bring to me little uh, religious quilts or political sayings or political quilts. No, what I love has been taken away from me. And what you're offering as a comfort, I don't want it because the pain is so deep and the pain is so real. And I believe this is what many Africans Americans are experiencing today, a real pain where they're saying, I don't want to be comforted. It can't, we can't take any more of this. I have four children. I have two boys, two girls. My son is 30. One of my daughters is 26, 22, and then an 18-year-old son. And so their mother and I, we were in our bedroom, and once this news of George Floyd, once they heard it, they look at their phones, YouTube or something, whatever they were watching, they come in and they say, Dad and Mom, my two girls, they say, what in the world is going on? They're like, Dad, this hurts. What are we going to do? How are things going to change? And so from their, their, their remarks and their comments, all this pain begins to just gush out of their hearts. Now, you have to understand, I'm a pastor. My wife, she's a pastor. And so, and we're the, their parents. And so my first, my first uh, reaction was, okay, let me try to comfort them. Let me try to give them some words of encouragement. Let me try to give them some hope. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't want to hear any words of hope. They didn't want to hear any words of comfort. They had their, they said, this needs to happen here. This needs to happen there. We're mad. We're angry. We're upset. Why do they treat black people like this? Why do we have to keep going through this? And I'm telling you, if, if you could have been in that room and felt the heat and felt the, the emotional temperature that was existing in that conversation, not because we were yelling at one another, but because of the pain that were in these girls' lives that have only lived 20-something years, but they've read and they've heard and they've seen and they've watched and they've read, they've heard, they've seen and they've watched, and that pain had just re had reached a place of eruption within them, and they said, what do we do with this pain? How is this going to change? And that's the cry of a lot of younger African-American uh, 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 men and women, they're crying out. They're saying our hearts hurt. Our minds hurt. We've had enough of, of being put on the back burner. We've had enough of trying to wait till things happen. Something hap needs to happen now. They're weeping. They're crying out like Rachel, and they refuse to be comforted. And their cry is, Lord, we want justice. I was reading through the book of Revelations the other day, and I was reading through the, seven, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, part about the seven seals and how when one of the seals opened, the scripture says that the martyrs were in this particular place and they were crying out, oh God, how long before you avenge our blood? And so here it is, even in scripture, you see the martyrs crying out for the justice of God. And the hearts of many African Americans are crying out for justice. I know a friend of mine, I won't mention his name, but his son was killed many, many years ago, shot, he was handcuffed and shot in the back by a policeman and nothing had ever happened to that person who did that. And he had to live, his family had to live with that pain and live through all that different anguish on a daily basis for years. And so when we talk about trying to forge relationships, loving your neighbor, uh, being Christ-like, discipleship, we have to understand as much as we can the pain and understand it, yes, but also acknowledge it and say that it's there. We just can't run to the next thing and say, okay, well, let's just pray about it. You know, yes, forgiveness and those things uh, are, 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 are need to be uh, a part, but we have to have a discussion about that as well, too, in terms of how we work through those things. But there needs to be the acknowledgement that, there are people who are suffering because of political systemic injustices. And the pain is so deep that natural and normal comfort 
is not going to cut it. Now, when we talk about injustice and we talk about someone being treated wrongly, Jesus was the person, was the, was the single most person on the face of the earth that experienced more injustice than anyone. Think about this. The Bible says that he made the heavens and the earth. All things were created by him and through him. He made humanity. All that we see, we love, we experience, we enjoy, it was made through him. The scripture tells us that he even came to his own, but his own, they did not even receive him. Jesus was an individual who never did anything wrong. There was no guile in his mouth. He never misspoke about a person. He never talked behind a person's back. He never said anything untruthful about any individual. All his actions were right. Everything he did was for the benefit of a person, benefit for humanity, to bring him to a place where they could find what was best for them couched within the will of God. Jesus never harmed anybody. His whole mission was to help, to emancipate, to break yokes off of people, to set people free. You know, you think about one of my favorite stories in the scripture was the story of the demoniac. And now here was a man that, you know, I, I call him legion. The Bible says he was possessed by legions of devils. And the man's life was so out of control that the Bible says that there were, uh, no one could tame him. So this man, he was naked. He dwelt in a graveyard. They tried to chain him to, to, to kind of confine him, but uh, through the demonic strength, he was able to break the chains and so forth. But Jesus went to that man, and he loved him. He touched him. He healed him, and he delivered him to the place where the Bible says this man who was so broken in, the, in such pain to the point where he cried out every night, he found total healing and deliverance and peace and acceptance and love from a person that from the person of Jesus, and no one else on the face of the earth had ever gave him that before. That was the kind of person Jesus was. He only did good. Jesus went about doing good, healing all those that were oppressed by the devil. But look what happened to him. The Bible tells us that he died the life of a criminal. He was accused as a criminal. Trumped up charges, things that were not real. Uh, they said that he did things that he didn't even do. But we understand, we understand that in God's sovereign plan, Jesus didn't come to the earth to live. Jesus came to this earth to die. He was the sacrificial propitiation for our sin. The scripture says that he was the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He came so that he could take our iniquities, our sins, our transgressions, our wickedness, our prejudice, our hatred, our pride. And he came so he could bear that so we could find forgiveness and freedom in the sight of God. Jesus came to die so that we could be free. He experienced injustice so that we could be justified. Now, we understand theologically that that was all a part of God's sovereign plan. Jesus' execution, crucifixion on the cross was part of God's providence for us to experience the life that he desires. Adam blew it, but Jesus won it, right? So God allowed that to happen so that we could live and be a part of the family of God. Now, for just a second, let's just put the theology, let's, we're not moving away, but let's just kind of scoot it over about an inch or two. Let's just, uh, maybe just kind of for a moment, let's just, I don't want to say forget, but just kind of, uh, just take our eyes off of, uh, just a second of the theology in terms of the sovereignty of God, the purpose of God, the plan of God, and so forth. Now, don't, don't get so religious on me and say, how can you do that? Listen, we're not moving it totally out of sight. We're just kind of scooching it over a little bit so we can see something else. 
if we look at how God fulfilled the plan and what happened, if we look at the, 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 the pragmatic workings of how Jesus went to the cross and died, it's amazing how that injustice was carried out. The Bible says in the book of uh, Matthew that Satan had entered into Judas. So Jesus was having the Last Supper with his disciples, and uh, they're, they're eating. They're just kind of kicking back. They're, they're chilling. They're just enjoying their time together. Jesus is getting them prepared for what's going to happen. And all of a sudden, he makes this statement. He says, one of you, he says, didn't I choose uh, uh, 12 of you? And, uh, you know, one of you is, uh, is unclean. One of you is a devil. And he says, so the disciples are like, wait a minute, man. I, I don't want to be the cat that's the devil. You know, who, who is it? Who is it? So John is leaning pretty close to Jesus. So Peter kind of nudges him and says, find out who he's talking about. And Jesus overhears and he says, the person who is dipping their bread in the bowl with me is the one who's going to betray me. And so Jesus says to Judas, he says, go do what you have to do and do it quickly. So Judas goes out and he goes to the religious system of the day, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, uh, the religious powers of the day, the system of the day. And he, uh, uh, they, they uh, devise a plan where uh, he's going to hand Jesus over to them. And we know what happens there. And then the religious power, religious system, what they do is they say, we're not going to be guilty of this. So they try to bring it to the political system, the Roman governor, Pilate. And they go through a number of exchanges. Pilate uh, is saying, you know, listen, uh, who are you? They say you're the king of Jews and so forth. And then finally, we know in the story, Pilate washes his hands and he gives him, he, he uh, uh, sends him back to uh, the Sanhedrin. But ultimately, they end up crucifying Jesus. When we think about system, we say change the systems, change the systems. It's important for us to understand how systems work how systems of injustice function and what takes place. So when we look at the, when we look at the, 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 the most uh, unjust act in the history of humanity upon Jesus Christ, this is what we have. We have Satan filling an individual, Judas. We have Judas going and engaging a religious system, and then we have a religious system going and engaging a political system. So when we ask ourselves the question, what's going on? Why is this taking so long? Now, I'm, I'm talking to the church today. I'm not doing a, a speech in front of the public. I'm not talking to un, uh, 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 non followers of Christ per se, but I know maybe this will uh, uh, you know, uh, hit some people as well, but I, I, I'm, I'm talking to those that profess Christ. We have to understand that while, yes, systems, and while, yes, policies, and yes, prejudice, prejudice in those type of things uh, play a significant part in injustice, one of the elements that we, that we fail sometime to put in the mix is the whole spiritual piece. Satan entered Judas. Judas then went to the religious system. The religious system then went to the political system. I believe, as we said earlier, we have to acknowledge and understand the pain, but then also we have to understand the stronghold of a system. How can something so unjust continue to exist year after year decade after decade, century after century, if it's just purely human. I think many times when we read scriptures, like we look at John 10, 10, we say the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that they may have life and have life more abundantly. And I think sometimes we put Satan, uh, we put Satan in this little tiny box. He's this little dude with a pitchfork that's just trying to make you eat too much chocolate cake, you know, or or, 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 or make you cheat on your girlfriend or cheat on your wife or your husband or that type of thing. He's just trying to tempt you. But we, don't, we, we fail to understand sometimes that even some of the systems that are oppressive, there are forces behind it. Now, I, I don't want, I don't want to you know, just be 
you know, some super hyper spiritual guy that's just trying to say, you know, you blame the devil for everything. No, but there is a part of that. There is a spiritual element and there is a human element. And I believe as the church of Jesus Christ, we have to address both. If the system is going to change to stop the oppression of African-American people, stop the oppression of people where, where it's, it's okay. I mean, the, 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 I, I, I confess, I didn't watch the whole video. I, I couldn't do it. I, I couldn't do it. I saw a couple pictures, and that was enough for me. I saw the police officer with his hands in his pocket, with his knee on a man's neck. And the man looked like he was, I, that, that's, that's about all I could take. It was just, it was too disturbing. His hands were in his pocket, his knees on the man's neck, and he's like, I'm just waiting for somebody to bring me a cup of coffee. How can something be that callous? I guarantee you in his mind, he never thought that he would have to pay a price for that. He never thought that the system that he was a part of would bring him to a place of justice. He never thought that, that, that hundreds of thousands around the world would rise up over something like this. If we're going to change the system, yes, we need policy. Yes, we need accountability. But church, we have a responsibility to understand the pain, to understand the issue, but we also have a responsibility to address the demonic forces behind the systems so that they can be broken, so that hearts can be changed, so that pride can fall, so that injustice can fall, so that compassion can fall in the name of Jesus. And so it's important for us to pray. Now, I know I may get ridiculed for saying this because I may not be in sound militant enough, but I don't believe that prayer is a passive activity. I don't believe that prayer is just, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul, my soul to take. Lord, bless mommy, bless daddy. Lord, bless my puppy. All that's cool. But I believe prayer is, 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 is much, much, much more. It's that, but it's much more expansive. And it has the power to tear down injustice. It has the power to tear down walls. It has the power to make change. It has the power to uproot those principalities and those powers that would hold and lock systems in place for century. Prayer has the power so that policy can work. Prayer has the power so that accountability can come forth. Prayer has the power so that justice can be woven into systems that are broken and systems that, 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 that hold their knee on the neck of people. See, the Bible says this. God says in, in, in the book of uh, uh, um, Chronicles, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their lands. When injustice happens, God does something. He listens for the cries of his people. He listens for the cries of those who say, we can't take it anymore. He listens for the cries and say, God, will you please come and help? Will you please come and do something? Will you please come and move? God listens to those cries. The children of Israel in an oppressive Egyptian system, God comes, he taps Moses on the shoulder and he says, Moses, I have seen the oppression. I have heard the cries and the groanings. I know they're suffering. God is a seeing, he's a hearing, and he's a knowing God. And I believe, yes, we've got to work to change policy. Hear my heart. Yes, we have to work to change systems. But church, I believe we have to come together and pray. That moaning, groaning, anguish in your heart. Don't waste it. Don't just allow it to just uh, 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 hibernate in your soul. Turn it into lament. Turn it into intercession. Turn it into a cry to God for God to work 
and for God to move and for God to make a difference. Yes, these are difficult times that we're in. There are times when it's like, what, what do we do? What do we say? But I believe that as we engage our hearts with one another, as we engage our hearts with God, I believe God will answer us. I believe God will make changes. I believe God can, he, he, he can turn this thing and he can bring wholeness and he can bring healing. It's beyond our imaginations. Now, you know, if I could just get, you know, old school preacher for about two minutes on you, you know, like some of the, the old guys would preach, they would, they would tune it up and they'd have an organ going, dun, 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 and they would say, is there not a balm in Gilead? Is there not a balm for the sin, for the, for the, the sin sick soul? Is there not a healing ointment that can come upon this nation? Is there not a healing ointment that can heal the black pain? Is there not a healing ointment that can drown out the prejudice? Is there not a healing ointment that can unite hearts? Is there not a healing ointment that can bring joy? Is there not a healing ointment that can bring justice? And I want to tell you there is a healing ointment, and the healing ointment is J-E-S-U-S, Jesus. And he said, if my people would call out to me, if they would understand and love one another, then I can work and do something mighty. Church, this is time for us to arise. This is time for us to arise, not on our own feet, but to arise by going down to our knees and falling on our faces and crying out to the Lord God of hosts. Only you can fix this mess. Only you can bring the healing. And I believe if we do that, we'll see God do some wonderful things. So just a couple takeaways here. Put the effort in. Understand the pain. Dive into the relationship, acknowledge what's going on. Say, well, you may not say, I, I totally get it. You don't have to totally get it, but just get it some. Then understand, Jesus experienced injustice and that the system that oppressed him was not totally all human, but there was a spiritual component to it. The church is equipped to address that spiritual component as we deal with the natural part, the relationships that we have with one another. And if we do that, together we can see God work a miracle and we can see the balm poured out upon our country, upon all ethnic groups, and we can see God glorified through his son Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for even hope in this difficult situation. And I pray for my black and brown brothers today and sisters that, Lord, you would touch the heart. Lord, you understand the pain. Oh, God, you understand, Lord, what is going on in the, the, the conversation in black homes across this country and across the world. And we pray today that you would intervene and give some sense of comfort and hope Lord, you know how to reach Rachel. And then, Father, we pray that as a church that we would, we would join together, and that our prayers would merge together to cry out to you for you to pour out your spirit in a wonderful way to bring healing and justice, to uproot systemic issues, systemic racism, systemic oppression, systemic injustice, and cause truth to come forth. We pray today the words that the master told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.